<laughs> so we have, of course, the, the very last speech of Friday evening here at Natacon. I hope you're enjoying the bar carts. Uh, if you aren't yet, you should be enjoying the bar carts. But before you go and enjoy the bar carts, we have another half hour talk here for you. So uh, just get started here. Brain fingerprinting. But we have Neon Rain, who is a photographer and director based in Los Angeles in New York City. Her work with MTV has won numerous nominations and two Emmy Awards. She was executive creative director of the Stand Up Campaign to improve America's education system. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation unveiled the Stand Up Campaign on the Oprah Winfrey Show in April 2006. She's here tonight to talk about brain fingerprinting. Hi, guys. We were totally supposed to send in some introductions so they knew what to say, and I'm like, I'm a girl who likes neuroscience. What, what, what more needs to be said? So, um, wow, there's a lot of people that here. Um, how many people have heard of brain fingerprinting? Has anybody even heard it? Whoa, some uh, half decent amount. Um, <laughs> so I am Neon Rain. Um, this is uh, the first time I've ever spoken to such a small room, so if I look very scared, that would be totally why. I'm used to talking to bigger rooms where I don't have to make direct eye contact with, with anyone. Um, so kind of how this speech came about is uh, one of my friends, who's a fellow speaker here, Tonkoff, and I were talking about neuroscience, and she was asking me about lie detectors in neuroscience, and I was like, well, do you not know that it's one of the most controversial things that are going on in neuroscience. And she was like, no, um, somebody should write a speech about it. Maybe you? So uh, I usually don't do these types of visionary speeches because these kind of visionary speeches, they always make you sound completely insane. Um, <laughs> so no, no, no more so than usual. Um, but yes, so uh, we will uh, start the speech. God, this is so scary in front of such few people. Okay, uh, and, and we'll get this started. So, introduction to a lie. Mark Twain once wrote, everybody lies, every day, every hour, awake, asleep, in his dreams, in his joy, in his morning. And as I see it, Mark Twain got it right. Lying is just so ordinary. It's such a part of our everyday conversations that we really hardly notice it. No matter how morally distasteful that some people may find the concept, deception seems to be a necessary element of human relationships. Don't believe me? Try to make it through your day without being deceptive to the people around you. Although we're socialized from the time that we can speak to believe that it's always better to tell the truth, in reality, society often encourages or even rewards deception. Interestingly enough, people will tell you that they think that they're good at spotting someone who's lying to them even though scientific studies do show otherwise. People are actually better at guessing when they're being told the truth than when they're being lied to. This is because we get led astray by our false beliefs on how we think a liar is supposed to behave. There's this perception that liars are easy to spot, and it's this faulty viewpoint that then causes us to base our assessment of truthfulness on such unreliable factors as personality and appearance. No matter what people would like to make you believe, there's no such thing as a dead giveaway when it comes to figuring out whether or not someone is lying to you. Even people who we consider to be experts in the art of catching people in a lie, such as police or judges or custom officials, when they're actually tested in a laboratory, don't do much better than chance. So technically, you could flip a coin and be just as right as the experts. The sad truth is, if you really want to be a good liar in today's society, you need not worry about, about what behaviors actually separate lies from truth tellers, but instead just focus on what uh, behaviors people think separate them. We are all liars, every one of you in this room. You lie to yourself and you lie to others. You tell verbal and nonverbal lies, bald faced and devious lies, kind hearted and self serving lies. You tell lies of omission and lies of commission and everywhere in between. There's no doubt that lying is both a common and complex phenomenon. Research is now appearing that seems to hint to the fact that depressed people may actually delude themselves far less than their non-depressed peers when it comes to the amount of control that they have over situations and the effects that they have on other people. 
It could be that a certain amount of self-delusion, what we consider lying to ourselves, may be essential for mental health. Uh, it's also been suggested by an evolutionary theorist that deception detection may have played an important role in the human brain to help us develop our impressive cognitive powers. Since no specific physiological signs of deception or guilt have been found to exist, this makes it next to impossible to create a standard legal definition of what lying is. With all these factors to take into consideration, you can only imagine how hard it would be to come up with a method to detect the many different forms of deceit and the many different ways that we deceive. Science has long been on a quest to create a credible lie detecting machine and it's easy to understand why since we're such poor detectors of lies and such great tellers of them. Such a machine would be the scientific equivalent to the holy grail of all human interactions. So we're going to go through a quick history of the detection of human lies. The concept of monitoring someone for showing physiological clues of stress as proof of lying is an ancient one. In India, a person accused of a crime uh, was required to chew on dry rice and then spit it out. If the rice remained dry, then they were guilty. A similar technique was used during the Spanish Inquisition. They would give people a little piece of bread and cheese, and if it got stuck in their throat, they were considered guilty. The premise of these bygone interrogation techniques is that if someone was a liar, you'd be able to tell by the dryness of their mouth. When faced with a stressful situation, like this one, uh, you probably notice that your heart starts to beat faster, you breathe more rapidly, your skin gets cold and clammy, your pupils dilate, the hair on the back of your neck stands up, and yes, your mouth gets dry. There's also changes that you don't notice going on as well, like reduced blood flow to your kidneys and digestive system. The overall effect of these changes is to sharpen your senses, which allows you to perform optimally in a life-threatening situation. This is called the stress response. You may have also heard it as the fight-or-flight response, and it's a normal physical response whenever you feel that you're being threatened. The interesting thing about this response is it does not make a distinction between physical and psychological th threats. This means that most people's stress response will not only be triggered by phys physically dangerous things, which we consider to be the experience of fear, but also to be uh, experienced by unique events that are specific to the individuals that are psychological. And this is what we consider the experience of anxiety. Something that sets off one person's stress response does not necessarily mean it's going to set off someone else's. And it's a really interesting point to ponder that someone can feel happiness and enjoyment doing something that may cause a severe panic attack in other people. Anxiety is really interesting. It involves our ability to use our own memory and imagination to move backwards and forwards in time. A large portion of anxiety is produced by the anticipation of future events. Without a sense of personal continuity, we wouldn't be able to have experience anxiety. Although anxiety is related to fear, they're not the same thing. Fear is a direct focus specific on a specific event or an object that a person is consciously aware of. Anxiety, on the other hand, is kind of unfocused and vague, and its specific cause is kind of hard to pin down. It will actually take to the end of the 19th century for us to fully create a measuring device for the detection of deception based on this stress response. None of the pieces were new, but it was the first time they had been used together for this purpose. Enter the polygraph. It was in 1917 that a Harvard psychologist and lawyer, better known for creating the Wonder Woman comic character, published a paper that argued that deception could be detected by measuring systolic blood pressure, and this would be, quote, the end of mo man's long, futile striving for a means of distinguishing truth-telling from deception. If you've ever had your blood pressure taken, systolic is the top number on the reading. It's the peak blood pressure when your heart is squeezing blood out. It took to the 1920s when a police officer and his colleague in Berkeley, California, finally expanded on the Harvard psychologist's method to measure and record multiple physiological measurements to use in their interrogation of criminal suspects for us to be know, uh, for the polygraph as we know it to be born. 
The polygraph would end up going through several revisions through the years, but really the basic idea behind the polygraph hasn't really changed a lot since we were feeding people dried rice. Um, the underlying theory of a polygraph is when people lie, they get measurably nervous about lying. How it works is that a baseline is established by asking the subject questions that the investigator knows the answer to, and deviation from this baseline is considered to be lying. In these days, polygraphs typically consist of a set of probes that feed into a laptop computer and use scoring based on computerized algorithms. Four manufacturers in the US and Canada do offer polygraph tests for a cost of roughly $7,000 to $11,000 a piece. Understandably, over the course of the past century, there's remained a huge and varied controversy on how we use the polygraph and when. A person who remains cool under pressure may beat the polygraph, and contrastingly, a person who doesn't handle a stressful situation may be inaccurately labeled as a liar. Negative results can also be attributed to, co to coercion uh, by the administrator of the polygraph itself, since horrifyingly enough, half of the US states don't require that the examiners be licensed. Polygraphs have not been admissible as evidence since 1923 in most federal courtrooms, but it took till 1988 for the government to enact the Employee Polygraph Protection Act. Despite a long wavering faith in polygraphs, about 40,000 of these exams are still done a year in the United States, which means that the polygraph industry astonishingly still rakes in tens of millions of dollars annually. These fallible tests are being used by government to screen employees, law enforcement agencies to interrogate suspects. A growing number of insurance companies have now jumped on board as proof that a person's claim may be fraudulent. And the Pentagon has also recently issued a type of handheld polygraph to the US Army soldiers to help with interrogation with screenings overseas. But I digress. The problem with basing lie detection on the stress response is that there's no scientific formula that can establish a regular correlation between physiological changes in the body and lying. There are many reasons that one can be afraid when wired up to an unfamiliar machine and, sub and subject to a barrage of questions over an extended period of time. A lot of people don't realize that it's not like in the movies. A polygraph test can last anywhere from an hour to three hours. So there's a lot of reasons that you can be scared other than being caught in a lie. You can also have the simple fear of not being believed if you're telling the truth. Mm, dry mouth. Yeah, anxiety going. <laughs> Our brain waves the new fingerprints. So I, the need for a better way to detect lies has been long overdue. But it was actually the September 11 attacks in, two th the September 11 attacks in 2001 that brought about new urgency to the subject as the United States started looking at its concept of domestic security with new eyes. In 2000, uh, 2002 report, the polygraph and lie detection, the National Research Council, after analyzing decades of polygraph use by the Pentagon and the FBI, concluded that it was still too unreliable to be used as personal screening in national labs and recommended a vigorous pursuit of other uh, means of lie detection. I don't have any uh, dry mouth, so I can't turn my page. Okay. So since then, the field of lie detection has been quietly reinventing itself. The Department of Defense has now revised and supplemented its polygraph program to include non-polygraph uh, non techniques in detecting deception. And I love this. It updated its name from the Department of Defense Polygraph Institute to the Defense Academy of Credibility Assessment. So this is what it's called now. It's Credibility Assessment. Uh, it's the new name for lie detecting. So whereas the whole area of research around the detection of deception has really been minimal for the last half century, a flood of new government money has been triggering a, a, a wave of research to find a replacement for the polygraph. And right now, the race is really on for a new type of lie detector. Our societal experience, thank you, our societal experience with the polygraph, uh, the polygraph should be a cautionary tale Because we really have let our over-eagerness in the past actually out, like, outweigh the scientific evidence. Because the polygraph was actually used for quite a long time and is still used today. 
Um, and now there's no, more and more, uh, there's more and more things coming out for the detection of deception. So it's not really hard to see as the technology is changing that it'd be really easy for history to repeat itself. So uh, one of these next generation devices that's been in the news a lot lately that you may have heard of and whose creator was named by Time Magazine as 100 of the innovators that may be the Picassos or the Einstein of the 21st century actually determines whether specific information is stored in a subject's brain using electrical brainwave responses to words, phrases, and sounds, or pictures that are presented to a subject on a computer screen instead of looking for th the stress response. The technique is called brain fingerprinting, and it was developed in university labs using CIA money. Now, despite its name, brain fingerprinting is more similar to the polygraph than it is to actual fingerprints. Um, but it's used the same way. Like, the whole point is to see whether or not somebody was at the scene of a crime. So brain fingerprinting records the brain's activity through electrodes that are attached to the skull. And it feeds data into a specialized computer that, is, that uh, has been programmed to recognize that aha moment in your memory when you recall something that is familiar to you. It's based on the accepted notion that neuroscience, uh, in neuroscience that about a third of a second after a person notices something significant, their mind makes this mental click of uh, recognition. And you can actually see a predictable and distinct uh, spike uh, on a measuring device. Um, since it's looking for evidence of knowledge and not whether or not someone's trying to be deceptive, it's thought to bypass the faulty data that can come from relying on the stress response. So this really kind of sounds really easy. You know, let's strap a few electrodes on someone's head and we'll determine whether or not their brain contains information. But we should really be skeptical of the growing tendency to reduce all human traits and behaviors to the level of brain activity, because it really does not map that easily. Moreover, understanding the brain is not the same as understanding the mind. Experiments have demonstrated that a disciplined person can control the EEG response of his or her brain by imagining emotional uh, events as the stimulus is presented, which would potentially allow them to defeat this test. So in other words, it's quite tricky to distinguish between brain signals that are actually produced by actual memories and those that are produced by imaginative memories. And I'm sure I don't have to explain to you that even if brain fingerprinting was 100% valid, just because a, someone's memory doesn't always lead to the truth. I mean, look at car accidents. Look at, you know, uh, you know violent crimes. Ooh, hi. Um, you, you'll, t <laughs> you'll totally see that if you ask, you know, five or six people what has happened, they'll tell you five or six different things. Um, so what this is all leading up to is that uh, a very unsettling scenario actually happened in June 2008. This is the most romantic talk I've ever given. Wow. Just us and the lights are down. Um, yes, so anyway, <clears throat> unsettling scenario. Got to get to serious, serious business here. So India actually sent a shock through the neuroscience world by becoming the first country to convict someone of a crime related on the results of something that was very familiar to brain fingerprinting. How many people are familiar with this case? Have you heard about this case in India that they actually convicted someone? So this woman was accused of murdering her fiancé. And the judge said that the EEG, uh, that the, t the EEG test, which they have their own, it's an algorithm, so they have their own algorithm as opposed to the one in the United States, this Bangalore-based forensic science laboratory um, came up with their own version. And they said that it was proof that the accused brain held knowledge of a crime that only the killer could possess. And they sentenced her to life in prison. So... The really interesting thing about this is that there was a year-long review by the, on, with a government commission panel, and the scientists all came together, and they were headed by the Indian uh, national, uh, the chief of India's national neuroscience program prior to this case. And they told the government, please, please, please don't use this. Please don't use it in court, and don't use it in investigations. And 
the government came back and said, you know what? You guys took too long to come to this conclusion. So we're doing what we want, and, and this is our excuse. So despite the fact that their own government committee was like, yeah, guys, this is really not a good idea, um, they went ahead anyway. So it's really kind of creepy to think that a, a democratic country such as India, they plunged ahead with this technology despite their own panel's finding, and they sentenced someone to life in prison based on this. And I know you guys, what you guys are thinking. You're like, yeah, India, big deal. Like, tell me something I don't know. But a lot of people don't know that brain fingerprinting has actually been ruled admissible in one American court so far to date. Um, Iowa. In, in a case of Harrington versus the state of Iowa, the state released Terry Harrington, who served 24 years for the 1977 murder of a parking lot security guard. His lawyer had brain fingerprinting results admitted to court when data revealed that Harrington had no recollection of specific details from the murder case from the, using this technique. Now, a retired Ottawa police officer was the guy who was a security guard, and he was killed with a shotgun while working at a car dealership in the morning of July 22, 1977. And the key witness, Kevin Hughes, testified that Terry Harrington and another man we're going to go, tell them that they was going to go steal a car, and they killed a, the retired police officer in the process. So Harrington, is, from all, all that time he was in jail, he remained vigilant about his innocence through the whole time he was incarcerated. And he had so many unsuccessful appeals, and he told them that he was at a concert, and he went out driving afterwards, and he had witnesses that were like, yes, we were with him, we saw him. But the uh, jury decided to uh, believe the key witness and they convicted him to life without parole. Now, Harrington heard of brain fingerprinting and contacted the creator in hopes that taking the test would help his case. The trial judge actually said that the brain fingerprinting had very little influence on the case, and it was mainly the key witness coming forward later, saying he had lied at the trial because he didn't want to be charged with murder, and he thought that there might be like a little reward money coming his way. Now, for me, because I am Canadian. Um, one of the incredibly baffling things to me about the American justice system is the way you guys have scientific evidence admitted. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but from how I understand, you guys have two accepted standards. One is called the Fry standard, and the other is called the, I think it's the Daubert standard. Do I have a lawyer here to correct me? Then it's the Daubert standard. <laughs> To meet the Fry standard, scientific evidence presented to the court must be interpreted by the court as generally accepted uh, by a meaningful segment of the associated scientific community. In Dalbert, the Supreme Court held that federal trial judges are the gatekeepers of scientific evidence. And under the Dalbert standard, therefore, trial judges are the ones that must evaluate whether or not the testimony is both relevant and reliable. Now, this comes the really confusing part. So, Fry remains the rule in some states, and other states have adopted Dalbert, and yet you have other states that have a history of rejecting both Fry and Dalbert, and then they have like their own substitute their own standards in. Huh? Oh wow! I better talk quickly then. I thought I was talking quickly. So uh, it's important to note that the trial judge did admit the evidence of brain fingerprinting, the brain fingerprinting technique. And while Delbert requirements for admission of scientific evidence are not applicable in Iowa courts, uh, the judge nevertheless used Delbert uh, factors in deciding to admit the testimony uh, and ruled that brain fingerprinting met all of four the Supreme Court's criteria, uh, criteria. He found that the science had been tested, was peer-reviewed, published, uh, deemed to be accurate, and well accepted within the scientific community. Wow, I totally need more time. Anyway, <laughs> I totally, like, I always have so much information and such little time to present it in. Okay, so basically we're going to bounce forward into the brave new world of lie detectors. Um, and there's no technology to date that can actually tell people what uh, you're thinking, but there's a lot of things that they've been exploring. Um, and the biggest one is uh, fMRI. This is really big right now. 
And fMRI uses oxygen in order to figure out what parts of your brain are active. The whole premise is that if you're lying, then therefore it's active in different parts of the brain than in others. Um, so the really astounding thing is the fact that there's been maybe 20 tests on this, and they really can't, they've only done things like lie about the playing card that's in your hand. But there's actually two companies right now that are selling um, fMRI technology and tests that are being used as lie detectors. And on March 16th of this year, Wired reported on an impending case that was happening in San Diego that they planned to use an fMRI scan to emit evidence into, um, into court for, of all things, a juvenile sex abuse case to decide whether or not the minor should stay in the home. So I'm sure you guys aren't surprised to hear that there was a big public uproar about this. And I don't know if it was whether or not it was the media blitz or just, you know, if it was coincidence. Uh, but they totally uh, ended up, I think it's pulled, but they could totally change. This is, right now, it could go either way. We really don't know what's going on. Wow, you guys are going to miss all the good stuff. Okay, so we'll just skip to, anyway, so uh, I was basically going to talk about the fact that uh, airports are definitely going to, uh, been trying to implement this. Already in Moscow, they have a lie detector test. They've been running trials. Um, the TSA is really funding a lot of places in order to do this. So I guess we'll just skip to the end. So um, scientists are working hard to map the human brain. Although the Human Genome Project has been completed uh, for more than five years, the maps of the brain we have are pretty much like those primitive maps that people have drawn of the new world. We can see crude outlines, but we really have no idea when it comes to the true lay of the land. As neuroscience moves forward, it'll bring lie detection technology advances with it far beyond the, uh, the, the flawed promises of the polygraph. Can we really doubt that pseudo-colored pictures of a person's brain lining up as proof that someone is lying will undoubtedly be just as persuasive to our society as the polygraph's patterns of squiggly lines on paper? The degree of which brain scans will be admissible in court still remains to be unclear, but there's no doubt that the agenda of companies that sell fMRI and brain fingerprinting as lie detectors will do whatever it takes to push the acceptance of these products, since allowing scans as legal evidence can p open up potentially legal and lucrative markets. If these merchants of what can be considered still fledgling lie detector technology are able to get their way, it could quite possibly alter our laws and create new methods uh, to determine criminal intent or criminal responsibility. The, remite, the, the right to remain silent would be pretty useless if investigators can accept, uh, like, think about, you don't have to say anything, and they're like, oh, we totally know whether or not you're guilty or not. And the whole concept of using machines to detect human deception requires for, pu far more public scrutiny than it has up until now. And we really have to have a serious conversation about pushing the boundaries of neuroscience far beyond the clinical. The unreliability of the polygraph has allowed us to escape for almost a century without ever really having to confront the serious consequences that having a credible lie detecting machine could have on a whole culture. We're at the beginning of a substantial transformation in our understanding of the human brain and our ability to actually intervene with how the brain works. The pace that lie detection technology has been progressing lately should be prompting an urgency to debate the legal and ethical implications surrounding its future use. Standards need to be put into place as we move forward in order to prevent the potential for abuse. As ridiculous as this seems, now is the time as a society that we need to address whether or not we actually have the right to privacy when it comes to our own thoughts because there may be a day in the not so distant future that corporations and the government will be the ones that answer that question for us. Did I make it in five minutes? <laughs> Man, I wrote way more stuff. I'm not used to such a small slot. So, um, yeah, I guess that's it. I totally had so much stuff that I was like totally like, oh, I'm just gonna skip this part and the part about the airport and the part about all the new technology and Mark Twain also said if you want to listen to this conversation, you could do it like this now, but if you want to listen to everything, you need to hit this button. Yeah, yeah, I kinda screwed up on that one. But yes. So I guess am I done? I don't know, I'm the last one. I don't know if I do questions or if I'm just free. Born free? 
Does anybody have any questions about all this stuff that I skipped? Anybody? Uh, I skipped about the fact that um, I skipped about the fact that they're actually um, the the Moscow or airport that's been running the tests actually sued these two professors because they wrote this paper and they published this article that basically said lie detectors are bunk. And instead of this, uh, instead of the company saying, hey, this is all our research, they just decided to sue and said, you're not allowed to talk about this. And they threatened the magazine, and the magazine pulled the article. Um, and so they also threatened to sue if these people ever said, like, ever talked about lie detection technology again. So basically, we're going to really, now that lie detection is big money, right, we're really going to have this thing between science and, like, companies and corporations, there's going to be this huge fight over who's going to win. Because like I said, if there's money in lies, they're going to push forward with all this lie detection technology that uh, if we're ready or not, it's coming. There's already two startups that are already offering fMRI, uh, fMRI. Brain fingerprinting has already been accepted in one court, so it's really not that far-fetched uh, in the future. Yes, you and the hat in the front. I, I wouldn't say that, that they lie, but I would say it was fair to say that they might possibly be deceiving people on their products. <laughs>